Hey everyone, this is Steve Bishop from ProgrammingMadeEasy.com and of course, Gartman Technical Services. So uh, today's video is gonna be another In My Opinion video where you guys get to ask me whatever kind of questions you'd like. Typically, these are technology related questions or software development related questions, uh, but I'm always open to whatever kind of things you guys wanna talk about. So if you have a question, please, 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 please put that question in the comment section below this video. And I add it to, I have kind of a running tab of all of the questions you guys ask me. And I just kind of pick and choose one each week that I want to do. And hopefully I get one of these done every week. I try to anyway. I don't always succeed at that, but I'm trying to get one of these done every week for you guys. So um, please keep sending me those questions. Even if you've already asked one and you have another one that comes to mind, um, please send it, you know, send it in. And more questions I get, the better the chance that I'm going to cover a topic that somebody's really going to enjoy. So, uh, you know, more variety, the better. So um, today's question comes from, uh, I, I know, again, I'm going to mispronounce this name. I'm positive, uh, Didier Folly. Uh, it's spelled D-I-D-I-E-R, Didier, I think. Uh, so Didier says, hi, Steve. First of all, I want to thank you about all the work you have shared with us till now about Microsoft Access and C Sharp. I also love the new videos, the In My Opinion videos. I learned more and more every time with your videos. Keep going. You are a great teacher. Well, thank you very much, Didier, and flattery will get you everywhere. Uh, so I wonder if you have some experience with how to manage the incidents from all your customers in your company. Do you have any advice on what kind of programs to use or what techniques to set up inside a company to allow the ID department uh, to manage all incidences and tickets, the ones that you get by email, by phone, by chatting with colleagues and so on? I always feel overwhelmed and I think I'm not the only one to feel that way after a huge day of work and I simply have more work to do. I hope to see an In My Opinion video about this topic. By the way, I'm waiting for the next video on your channel. Thanks again for everything you do, a big fan. Well, um, first of all, thank you, Didier, for this wonderful question. I really, really appreciate it. And thank you for all the, the praise and the accolades. I sometimes wonder my head might get too big from all the wonderful things you guys say about this channel. But I'm just so glad and thankful that you guys are learning something from it, that you guys feel like I'm actually contributing to your lives in some way. And I know I've had some really wonderful messages sent to me about some, some wonderful things that you guys have had happen in your lives because of this channel. And it just, it really makes me feel fantastic that, that I could impact you guys that much. So um, I'm, I'm just really, really thankful. Um, the first thing I wanna talk about is something that, that Didier mentioned towards the end of his message. And I think it's really important to talk about first. It, it just really kind of stuck out in my mind. Um, that feeling of being overwhelmed by the work. There's so many things to do, so many tasks, and especially in the IT field, which I was a, a you know, I was at IT for 10 years before I got into software development. Um, and I worked on computers all the way back when I was a kid. So I kind of, I, I understand computers very well. Um, that overwhelming feeling, like there's just so much to do and it's never gonna get done. There's just, it just keeps piling up and getting bigger and bigger. Well, let me just tell you first and foremost, um, get used to it, okay? It's it's part of the job. It Honestly, it, IT support is exactly that. It is an overwhelming mob of tasks and tasks that you, uh, that you have to fix and problems you have to solve and things you need to research. And you're gonna always feel under pressure to go find the solution to something as soon as, as, as possible and as quickly as possible. Um, because you know that you have to, once you get that done, you've got something else you got to do that might even have a higher priority. So, uh, you just kind of have to get used to it. You, you really have to just say, you know, this is my job. This is what I do for a living. And, and it's, it's always going to be there. And I got news for you when your time comes and, and, you know, you go, you know, see the Lord at the pearly gates, you know, <laughs> I'm, I got news for you. There's still going to be a lot of work to be done by the tech support of the company that you work for. It's going to always exist. It's just always going to be there. So not to sound discouraging about this because there's actually a positive side to this. There's really a very big positive side to this. And, and I think once you realize this, it will change your mentality about the work a lot. 
And you have to remind yourself of this all the time. And that is, if it weren't for that work, you wouldn't have a job, right? If you didn't have all those tasks to do, who would need you, right? If, if everything works smoothly and perfectly and everything in the IT department worked perfectly, no one ever needed any help from you, why would you, why would you have a job? They wouldn't need you, everything works. So all of those tasks, all those jobs that you have to do and all those things that keep piling up, that just means the company relies on you. They need you, they, you have a lot of clout in that business because they cannot survive without you. That's important to remember. You are an important cog in that wheel, probably one of the most important cogs because businesses run on technology. Nowadays, they all run on technology. And if their technology breaks down, the business breaks down. That means you, in some cases, might even be more important than the CEO themselves. Okay, and I know a lot of people probably aren't going to like that idea, not like that perspective, and it's really hard to convey to other people. But think about it. If you go away and you're the most knowledgeable person in the system and you handle all these different tasks and then you go away, you get a job somewhere else. There, how many times have you heard, boy, if, if Dave leaves the company, we're screwed, right? <laughs> that happens in the IT industry because we are such an important component to it. We are such an important part I'm getting a phone call. Let me turn that off. Sorry. We're such an important cog in this in this wheel that they can't really do without us. And we can leverage that for making more money. We can ask for more money. We can ask for more privileges. We can ask for more vacation time. We can use that leverage. The more they rely upon us, the better we are, as in we, the better benefits we can get from having that employment. So don't think of all these tasks that you have to do as negatives. They're really a positive because without them, you wouldn't have the job you have. You wouldn't have the clout you have. You wouldn't have the respect that you have. So that's something just really kind of think about that for a minute. Okay. Think about there for a moment. And every time you get discouraged, every time it comes down, just remind yourself of that fact. If it weren't for me or if it weren't for these tasks, I would not have a job and I would not be this important in the company. So just something to think about. You guys can obviously handle it however you want, but I think that's that's how I usually get through it. When I have a big overwhelming amount of urgency on things and it feels like there's just so many tasks that I gotta do, I just remember that's that's part of the job and that's why I'm here is because there's so many tasks to do. So um, let's go, let's move a little bit beyond that. Besides the mentality, um, let's talk a little bit about how to manage these tasks. As, uh, as, the number of tasks that you get is going to grow with the business, right? It was going to grow with the company and is going to grow with the technology that you include with it. And companies are always trying to get better technology, something that's going to help them with their business and cut costs in a lot of other areas that are generally not IT. They're generally not looking to cut IT budgets. They're generally, well, sometimes they're cutting IT budgets because you know they're skimping everywhere, but typically the IT is not where they're gonna go, okay, we need to do some downsizing, let's cut back on our IT. It's because they realize the IT is the most important part of the infrastructure of their business. And typically they're looking elsewhere to do downsizing. So typically the IT is growing bigger and bigger, bigger new technologies, more streamlining of things, more people with special uh, specialities in the IT department. Um, when you need to manage these tasks though, this growing business, you need to have a really good support structure you, and you need a structure. You need some sort of plan in place to, on how to manage those tickets that come in. Uh, and if you don't, you need to go sit down and work on it. If you're just doing it fly by night, you know, by the seat of your pants kind of thing, when every time somebody comes and asks you for something, you go do it, that is not going to last. That is not going to keep you the most efficient at your job, nor as the department. And here's the the kind of bad thing about that. If you are the guy that they all come to and and you know you you're Johnny on the spot, you get right on the task that they've given you, whatever problem they've given you, and you just go do it, they're going to expect that from you. It's going to be the way they assume you operate. And anytime you have to tell them no because you've got something more important, they're gonna feel more let down because you're not doing, they're gonna feel like you're not doing your job. 
because you're not doing it the way you've been doing it. What What's going on? How could it be? You know, you must be starting to fail at your job if you can't do the same thing that you've been doing. So having a plan, having an infrastructure and getting everybody used to this infrastructure, everybody in the company that you work for, get them used to using the system rather than using you. OK, that's important. Get them used to using the system instead of using you. Um, I should probably coin that phrase. That's really good. Have them use the system, not use you. Um, I really just thought of that. <clears throat> so what kind of system should you have? Well, typically businesses as they grow, one of the, the, the more enterprise level businesses that have huge IT departments, what they typically have is multiple tiers of support. So your tier one support is typically things like resetting passwords for people, uh, helping them configure email on their cell phones or, you know, um, installing maybe some software like Outlook, uh, you know, Microsoft Outlook or Excel, um, you know, doing the simple little day to day tasks that, you know, you get bogged down with every day. Right. People come to you for these simple little things all the time and you need to solve them. Um, typically, that's going to be tier one type of stuff where you know, just a, a large group of people that have just enough knowledge about IT and about how to solve these things. They don't need to be really proficient with tech support. They don't need to understand domains. They don't need to understand any of that. They just need to know how to work a computer. And there's a lot of people that know how to do that. It's really not hard to find tier one support people. Um, but as tier one support people get wiser in their job and they start to understand the systems better, they start to get much better. And, and you start to get some go-to people that are tier one support. And eventually they, they trickle up to, and boy, I'm getting a phone call. I should have probably put this on, uh, <laughs> I, I should have probably put that on do not disturb, huh? Um, so you get these, um, these tier one people that have gotten better about understanding the infrastructure of things, and they start to become the go-to people for tier one support. That's when they should probably be kicked up to tier two where they have the more important things. They start to think about more things that are more business pertinent. Like, um, you know, if there's a special third party application that helps keep the company going and they, you know, maybe they can do the installation of that application, the setup and the management of those systems. Um, so maybe they, they're a little bit more knowledgeable than a tier one, but they still kind of handle some of those tickets but they start to learn, they start to use a bit more of the infrastructure of the, the company in order to solve those problems. They're not just there to, you know, to talk to people on the phone, they're actually solving legitimate business problems. Um, so that's typically what tier two is going to be, is your, your higher level, more understanding of the system, more complex problems that cannot be solved by tier one, right? So if tier one can't solve it, they kick it up to tier two, more knowledgeable people, more understanding of the infrastructure, they solve the problems. Now this filter is really, 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 really important. It needs to happen because tier two should not be spending its time doing a bunch of the tasks the tier one support should be doing. They need to be more focused on some of those other things, okay? They need to be able to solve the more complex problems because they're going to take longer to do. Typically the more complex problems take longer to solve. They, they start to identify the tier two, you start to identify some real genuine architectural problems or infrastructural problems within the company. They start to identify, we've got a firewall issue. We've got, uh, you know, we've got an application that has a bug in it now, and those need to be all kicked up now to tier three. Um, now, tier three is typically where you're going to start to see the more system administrators, the people who actually do the administration of the system. They do domain controllers, they spin up new, uh, you know, new email servers, they spin up new web servers, they manage the infrastructure of the system, okay? And they need to, they need to be able to focus on that, right? Tier three, they should be only handling those infrastructural problems. They should not be answering questions about how to change a password on someone's email account, okay? If you're tier three, the, the, the general habit, the, the, the tendency is when you're in technology, regardless of what level you're at, we have this desire to help and solve problems. And so when we get that call or get that, you know, that email that comes in from so-and-so, 
even if it's the CEO, right? You want to go help them. You want to go do it, but that's not your job. That's the job of tier one. It's the job of tier two. Tier three, you got to focus more on the infrastructural type of problems, solving the big issues. The company is growing. The company is expanding. What are the different servers that we're going to need? What are the different redundancies we're going to need? How are we going to manage the network itself? Do we uh, do we need Cisco routers? Do we need uh, you know sonic walls? Do we need whatever? Are we gonna um, are we gonna get some redundant internet connections? If we have failovers, backup systems, that kind of thing. That's all tier three stuff that you really got to start doing. And you can't be focused on those other things because you know those other little tier one and tier two things because that's going to detract away from your train of thought and what you should be doing as a tier three person. It's very important, the architectural and infrastructural type of things. You've got to stick with that if that is your job. So just try to resist that. Try to resist being Johnny on the spot that goes and solves those problems. That's what tier one is for. That's what the help desk is for, right? And help desk tier one can generally sometimes be the same thing. Sometimes they're different entities, help desk versus tier one. Um, but just in general, make sure that the business understands they need to go to tier one to start all of their problems, okay? When it comes to an infrastructural thing, right? When you're talking about budgetary concerns or, um, you know, we, you as the IT director decide we need more, we need another exchange server. We need, um, we need a bigger budget to manage. Uh, we're going to do some offline backups now. That's the type of thing that you might have to have a discussion with your CFO, COO, CEO, those, you know, all the, all the alphabets up there. You've got to have that conversation with them. But now you're talking about architectural things and infrastructure things. You're not talking about how to solve their problems on their phone. That's a perfectly valid interaction you need to have with them. And I understand that a lot of businesses, um, you know, the CEO might demand, I want the best person here to solve my problem. Um, and that's, if you're a CEO of a company and you're doing that, you should probably be looking at the way that you're utilizing your own, <laughs> your own, uh, um, your own company, your own personnel, because honestly, the IT director and, and uh, you know, the, the chief information officer, they, they, they really got other things to be doing besides solving your password problems. Um, but that's neither here nor there. I'm getting off subject. I apologize. <laughs> but typically, just try to try to make sure that everybody in the company, when they ask you a question, if you're, even if you're off work, right, or you're, you're, you're wandering around and you're talking with your colleagues or whatnot, instead of saying, oh yeah, I can go solve that for you, say, have you put in a ticket? Have you contacted our help desk? Have you asked them? Please do. The system is in place for a reason. It's to prevent you from feeling overwhelmed for your job. And it's, it's to filter those tasks so that the simple ones are handled by tier one, the more complex problems are handled by, by tier two, and then the infrastructural problems are starting to be solved by tier three, okay? It's just important that you create that system and you live and die by that system. Do not go outside of it because as soon as you do, that's when the company is going to start, the, the personnel are going to start to expect you to solve those problems outside of the system. So that's the biggest temptation. Now, that being said, also don't forget, whatever software system you have that manages these tickets, the ticketing system is only as good as the personnel putting the entries into the ticketing system. You have to stay on top of this. You have to keep your tier one employees on top of good note taking, okay? Complete note taking. Take the extra time to make sure your notes are complete and that everything in that conversation was put in that ticket. If you just have shorthand notes, some shorthand is okay, but make sure it's understandable. You're using a nomenclature everybody in the department understands, okay? If one person is using some words to indicate one thing and no one else is using those words or no one else is using those abbreviations, then that means they cannot do that anymore. You've got to stop them because the information, this is so important, the information you're putting into the ticket system is critical to your ability to understand the problem and, and solve it, okay? You don't wanna have to have 
the tier two personnel asking for the customer to retell the problem. Okay, that's a waste of time. That's a waste of energy. And, and really it means that the tier one person who took that phone call or took that email did not give complete enough notes. Okay, or they maybe tier one didn't know the right questions to ask. And that's a communication that tier two people can, can say, hey, next time you get a question like this, or next time you have a problem like this, ask these questions. That will help me do my job, okay? And that communication, building up a wiki, all right, building up this uh, this help desk um, solutions, right? Some sort of place that you can keep track of all of the tickets that you've had and all of the solutions that you've had um, so that you can have an easy reference for people to go back and find the solutions for things. That's also very important. Keeping track of all of the tickets you had, all the solutions you had to it, and again, the solutions, right? That needs to be well documented as well. Every time you have a problem, document the solution in as complete terms as you can. Take the time to do it. I understand we're all under a time crunch, we're all under pressure, but trust me, if you have that problem, you give good notes, you give good articulation of what the problem was, you follow up with the solution and you, get, you articulate the solution really, really well and you document it, then that means the next time you get it, you don't have to go back and try to rethink everything over again. So the next time it's faster. And the next time after that, it's even faster. The more times that you can refer back to that article, it just becomes faster and faster and faster until those tasks start to narrow down in the amount of time that they take to do. And you'll start to see some of those tasks take less time to do, and you're not going to feel as overwhelmed because you can do them fast. You can just pop those babies out. And maybe eventually you get some of the tier two tasks down to tier one because they're so well documented, the tier two doesn't need to handle them anymore. Okay, so documenting, documenting, documenting completely, full sentences, readability, maybe even have, I've even seen this, There is there has been an editor of comments, an editor of help desk tickets. Someone that goes through and their job is just to look at the tickets and ask tier one and ask tier two to finish those tickets or better explain things or maybe go in and edit them and, and, and modify them themselves. Someone to manage that help desk database, okay? That's their sole job. And that's a, a if your company is doing that, I'm telling you that they're on the right track, okay? Because the communication is everything when it comes to the help desk, okay? It's, it's such an important thing. I, I don't think I can emphasize this enough. You just have to get that knowledge base down to uh, uh, to something that's really good because then it just speeds everything up. Now, what about the software itself? So we talked about the practices of entering something in the system. What about the actual software? My suggestion is to build your own, okay? I, I'm just gonna tell you flat out that there are hundreds of help desk ticketing systems out there. There's just so many of them, lots of them free, some of them expensive, there's Microsoft Dynamics. There's, uh, I, I don't even want to go over all of them. There's just so many of them. Um, and, and I will show you guys actually a couple of them I really like in just a moment. But for me, my personal suggestion, my recommendation is build it yourself, okay? Because if you have your own ticketing system, which keeps track of the things that your company finds important, that's really, really what you should be doing. Have when you build it yourself, when you custom built your applications, you get exactly the information you need for precisely the reason you need it, okay? And you grow upon that. You start out with simple little things, maybe just a simple little ticketing system, and then it grows because people are going to ask you to add new things to it. So if you start out small with a little ticket system that keeps track of people's problems and the solutions and who was assigned to it and when it was solved and that sort of thing, it'll eventually continue to grow and grow and grow. Uh, and that's the best case scenario because you're matching the software to the practices of the business. And this is vital because that's what makes the company more efficient when it gets only the data it needs precisely when it needs it. If you have to go out and get some sort of software, if you have to go buy something, then that typically means that you will have to change some of your business practices to match the software. And I always say, you hitched your horse to that wagon. That was what you did. And, and once you're on it, it's very hard to get off of it. Once your company picks some software, and especially if it's some third-party application that's already built, 
you've hitched your horse to that wagon. If they decide two years down the road, they're going to change their entire way that the layout works and, and the naming convention of everything. Guess what? You've got to change the way you do everything. You've got to change the way you talk about everything. All your communication goes out the window because they change one word, right? So getting onto one of these third-party systems um, can, can definitely be a detriment. That's why I say custom-built applications are always the best thing to do because if your company decides to change the name of something, it's like that. You can custom, it's custom. You don't have to go ask someone else. You don't have to go ask that third party to go build it for you and change all of the places in the label that it's that way. You just ask your development division to go fix this in that help desk ticketing software and it gets done right away, okay? And you can make those changes. You, As the company evolves and makes changes, so can the software. You don't have to evolve the business to match the software. The software evolves to match the business. Big big difference. Very important. Now, that being said, we here at Gartman, we have our own ticketing system. We have our own software that we developed internally to manage tickets, both software development tickets and IT tech support issues, uh, as well as websites, because we manage a lot of different small business websites. So we have our own ticketing software. It's called OMS. Um, we, we manage all of our invoices, we manage our customers, we manage um, support tickets, we manage software development issues, bugs, bug tracking issues, that sort of thing. We do all of that through our application, our OMS application. So if you guys are interested in that, and I'm not trying to sell you guys on it, um, but if you guys are interested in something like that, some sort of ticketing solution, it's built on Access, which is the same technology you guys have been learning. Um, and you guys own the software. So we make it a point that, you know, once we give you guys this OMS, you guys own it for your company, okay? Um, so if you guys wanna make your own modifications to the database, have at it. We're, we're not gonna, you know, penalize you for making changes or anything like that. Um, but if you're interested in that OMS system, you know, you can always go to the Gartman Technical website. So gartmantechnical.com. And if you wanna set up a, an OMS demonstration, we'll be happy to do that for you. So I just kind of want to get that out of the way. Again, I'm not trying to do a sales pitch here. I'm not trying to sell you on that. I'm going to show you actually some free stuff, um, some alternatives besides just that, uh, that I think are out there that you guys could use that are pretty good. Uh, so I kind of want to switch over right now. Let me just get this all set up here. Uh, okay. So this first one is called Spiceworks. Now, um, Spiceworks is really, really nice. We have actually considered using it in the past. Um, it's a really nice ticketing system. You can see, we can see the open tickets, waiting tickets, closed, unassigned, my tickets, active alerts, past due tickets. So you can keep track of new tickets right here inside of Spiceworks. So it's a very simple little ticketing system. This is online. This is their, you know, in the cloud version. Um, so it's really nice because Spiceworks has a lot of other plugins that we can get into in a little bit, but they have the, in the cloud version, but they also have, um, one that you can download and install on your network. So you can download the help desk and from there you can add a bunch of plugins and stuff, uh, that can help you manage your network as well. But in general, this is just a simple little ticketing system. You know, you put the contact who it was that was having the issue, uh, a summary of the problem, a description, who it's been assigned to, the due date priority. So this is big, right? High, medium, and low. And then you have different categories. Um, you know, so you have different types of problems that you can have, and this can be customized to have different categories based upon your business. So this is a really simple little free application that's online. Spiceworks is really nice. Like I said, we've considered doing something like this in the past. Our company, you know, Gartman Technical Services has, has thought about using Spiceworks in certain circumstances. It just never really came to be that, that it was what we ended up with, but it's just a really nice platform and I like it. Now, there's more here than just besides the help desk. If you go to the App Center, and actually, you know what, let me backtrack here. Before I move on to that, I just kind of want to show you one of the really cool things I like about 
the Spiceworks help desk also is you can look at the knowledge base. And this knowledge base has a bunch of solutions for things already. So this is kind of like a community of articles. There's, you know, 7,500 different articles about different problems. So using MSTSC as a remote view controller. So there's articles that people wrote about how to do different tasks. And you can even add specific knowledge-based articles for your team. So well, like I was saying, you know, commenting, making, making good notes about what the problem was and about the solution will lead to an article that becomes part of the knowledge base of the company. And you can add that to the knowledge base right here inside of Spiceworks. You can create your own set of articles to manage your business's typical problems and how to solve them. So that's just really, really nice, I think, having this knowledge base, not only the community-based one, where everyone that's in the community has their own articles, but you can have your own team articles. And then of course, there's just mine if you wanna keep track of your own special little notes. Okay, so Spiceworks, I really, really like. Um, they have product reviews and all sorts of good stuff too, if you wanna check that out. Um, here in the App Center, once I do that, you'll see though that there's also network monitoring and inventory management. So if you're interested in trying to manage the inventory for your office, you can use the inventory thing. That's something you would actually have to download. And the same thing with the network monitor. It's, it's a download that you have to actually install on your system. It's free, right? It's completely free. That's one of the great things about Spiceworks is all of this is free. The network monitoring, the inventorying, the help desk, it's all completely free. And they have a bunch of these little plugins that you can add to the systems too. So you can have canned replies for all your help desk tickets. So whenever somebody submits something via email, you give a canned reply. Uh, you have a proper shelf. You need to share a file fast so you can do file sharing for 24 hours. IRC, if anybody's in IRC, you got box support for Spiceworks. So there's all these different little plugins. You got language packs if you speak a different language you can get for Spiceworks. Um, so there's a lot of really, really cool things here inside Spiceworks. So I would recommend it highly, highly, highly. Um, the other one that I like to use and have used in the past is one called SysAid. And SysAid is, um, it's a bit more of a complete solution than Spiceworks, more in that it, it also has like remote support functionality and kind of manages your, your stuff a bit more in an automated fashion and links things better. Like if you're having a problem with a computer, um, if you're having a, a, a support ticket for a specific computer, you can look at the history of all of the issues on that specific computer. So it's not just kind of a general database of issues like Spiceworks is, it can be very targeted and specific to the computer you're having an issue with or you know a particular person perhaps. Um, and, and I just really, really like Sysaid, but it's not free. And honestly, it's not very cheap. Uh, the prices for Sysaid are pretty expensive, but from when I've used it, it's been, uh, it's been very, very helpful. Now they do have a free version, at least they did. Um, full basic three admins, 120 assets. I think this is the free version. I don't know if it still is. It's been a while since I've been in the IT support industry and it's been a while since I looked at SysAid, but they did have like a hundred assets for free and like one admin back in the past. Now it looks like maybe three admins, but there's a lot of really cool stuff that comes with SysAid and I definitely would recommend it. It's been a great product in the places that I've used it. Um, so that's what I would say. If you're looking for something to help kind of manage your company, I really, really like SysAid. Now, there's a lot of other things. Um, you could use Dy Microsoft Dynamics. I've seen people kind of, you know, change up the way Microsoft Dynamics works a little bit to match their ticketing system. Um, there's obviously SharePoint, right? SharePoint is a good one. Uh, if your company already has SharePoint, then it has the tools necessary to build kind of an online web ticketing system. Uh, and in fact, I think there's even, for access, now that I think about it, uh, ticket, uh, ticketing system, yeah. I think there's some free ones. There's even some like um, the free ones when you first load up Microsoft, you can actually, Microsoft Access, they have some default, you know, like templating ones that you can do ticketing with. 
Zendesk is another really popular product. Um, Zendesk is, I, I found a little bit more difficult to work with than Sysaid, but they're both really good, powerful products. Anyway, I'm kind of getting off track here. I, I would say if you're really looking for quick, you know, free, easy systems to manage your ticketing, uh, and you don't want to go and build your own, Spiceworks is a great solution. If you're looking for something to really kind of manage your, your company and manage all the different uh, computers that are on it, Sysaid is a fantastic product. There's a really great, some really great behind the scenes reasons why I like Sysaid. Um, then of course, you could always use like, you know, SharePoint if you already have SharePoint installed, but by far the best thing you could do is build your own. Make your own application, okay? Make your own help desk ticketing system because nothing beats a software application that you can customize and you can build to, uh, to suit your specific business needs. So that's what I would highly, highly recommend. So there you guys go. Um, I hope that this has been informative to you guys. I hope that you guys um, got something out of this. Uh, if you did, please drop me a comment in the comment section below, letting me know what you liked about it, what you didn't like about it. Uh, if there's something else that this video has sparked your interest in or you have some other question that you want to ask because of this video, please drop me that question in the comment section below this video, okay? Uh, just, you know, doing that really helps me out. The more questions I have, the better. So anyway, again, if you guys did like this video, please give it the thumbs up. Make sure you like it. And as always, you can, you know, add it to your favorites and subscribe to this channel. Hit that little bell, get the alerts on the channel. Uh, you know, so anytime that I post up something publicly, you guys have it. And also don't forget, we have a Patreon page now. So if you want to contribute to the channel on a regular basis and really help me continue to grow the channel and, and, and uh, you know, pay some of the bills that it costs in order to make this because it's really not free. I got microphones and, and cameras and I kind of want to do an upgrade of the camera here pretty soon. Um, so just if you guys contribute, I really, really would appreciate it. You can go to patreon.com forward slash programming made easy. And again, uh, easy is spelled with uh, uh, just you know the letter E and the letter Z. Uh, so if you guys want to contribute there, it would really, really help us out. So thank you so much for watching, you guys. I hope you have a wonderful rest of your day. Bye-bye.